I think he needs, uh, he needs help with the stirs. You're going to put a stand of stir with him. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank oh. you very much. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Oh, this is fantastic. So I spoke here two years ago in the foyer, because that was, and that was, there was a few people in the foyer, there was half a dozen of that because I was out in the car park. And it was lovely, lovely sunny day, and it was very nice. And then we all went home, and that was it. And it was like a little event, a little local event. And today it's become this really rather overwhelmingly huge thing. Uh, one of the peculiarities, and I hope that doesn't say anything about either thing, is the amount of vehicles and special vehicles and conversions and bikes and scooters that are out in the uh, in front of the building that have been featured on fully charged or about to be featured on fully charged is rather overwhelming. Um, quad bikes, the scooters, uh, the electric uh, Volkswagen Beetle conversion is an episode that will go out in about a week's time, or two weeks' time. Uh, and so it's very, it feels very, very fully charged oriented, which I find slightly worrying. And a lot of people have come up to me today and said, you're the reason I bought my uh, dot, 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 and I'm always anxious when I hear that, because I'm expecting, and it's ruined my life. <laughs> <laughs> my wife's left me and my house burnt down last night because the batteries aren't safe because Clarkson was right. So, you know, all those things are slightly worrying. Uh, and so, uh, so I, the last, um, I suppose, four or five years I've been going around the country, not in a very, you know, intense way, but every now and then doing talks about electric vehicles. I've been doing a show called uh, Electric Cars Are Rubbish, Full Stop, Aren't They? Question mark. Uh, and it had the punctuation developed over the time I did it because originally it was electric cars rubbish, aren't they? Uh, because that's what we were told. And then it became uh, the mood of the general public, I, I said, to change a little bit because they were going, they constantly told they're rubbish by all the press, all the media, everyone is always doing electric cars down. But they were starting to hear from actual people who drove them. And so it then became electric cars are rubbish, full stop. Aren't they? Question mark. Because they weren't sure. And what I think we're seeing, we're in the middle of, no, we're in the very early stages of, is a, is a very big transition from, from reliance on, on hydrocarbons, not just for uh, transportation, but for power, for electricity, for everything. And it's going to take generations, plus, uh, you know, most of us here won't live to see the end of burning fossil fuels, but there's no question in my mind that there's no question in an enormous amount of really clever people who do economics and engineering and science that that's going to happen, that we will stop burning fossil fuels. Um, I think we should keep using fossil fuels, this is my argument, we should keep extracting oil and using it because it makes lots of really useful things that we don't burn. Uh, but I think burning it has to be a priority for the human race to stop burning it. I think that's the thing that I feel very strongly about. Um, and, and I think we're at this transitionary period which is which is by its very nature disruptive in the same way as, for instance, the internet has disrupted the industry I work in in television. It has had an enormous impact on it, but much less so than the music industry, which was basically devastated by the internet, because it was a completely new thing that no one saw coming. And you couldn't tell what uh, impact that uh, that technology would have. It was Found and very distressing for people. I, uh, some of you may not know this, but there was this fabulous tower in the middle of Los Angeles, the, uh, the, the, which was the one of the big record companies, huge, big, monolithic tower, which is now a derelict shell. There's nothing. I think they're now doing it up, telling it on hotels. Aren't they? So this huge, massive, multinational, multi-billion-pound industry built around the Eagles and Joni Mitchell and the Rolling Stones that made billions of pounds and turned over all this huge amount of money just went <clears throat> because of Spotify and some spotty nerd in the basement with his laptop who worked out that you could just share music man and that's like really cool and everyone shared music and suddenly no one bought it and suddenly you can buy the music, you can buy it, you know, it's free. And in the same way, electric vehicles and then the concomitant technology that goes with them, that it opens a door when you drive an electric vehicle. Because I'm sure many of you here understand that it opens a door that's quite annoying. It's not all good. It drives me mad. I used to really enjoy driving my Volkswagen Golf R32 with twin exhausts. I mean, that made me happy. <laughs> really good. And I, I didn't think about anything else. And it, all I would go, God, it uses loads of petrol. <laughs> Fill it up again. <laughs> there it goes. Marvellous. End of, end of thoughts. End of philosophy. End of ethics. Don't give a toss. Doesn't matter. I can get down the M4 at frightening rates. It's brilliant. It's got amazing acceleration. It makes loads of noise. It's really uncomfortable and really expensive to drive. Oh, I've got to get another set of tyres. And, um, you 
know, that's all that's all I ever thought about. And then this, immediately I got a bloody awful electric car, the whole thing collapsed in the middle of the night. And I thought, oh my god, I've got to think about this. You know, where does the electricity come from? Oh god, it's made by coal and you all burn coal and it's all dirtier than a diesel tank driving in your first through a nursery. It's <laughs> just the worst thing in the world. And then you go back in your petrol car and you go, hang on, where did the petrol come from? I can't remember. I did I pick it back at school, I can't remember. And then I because I'm lucky in working in the TV industry, I'd spent two days at an oil refinery. When you spend two days in an oil refinery, the one thing you stink, because they're quite smelly places, so your clothes and everything smells of oil refining. I don't even know, it's quite smelly. Amazing place, this is a big, there's a big refinery in uh, Pembrokeshire, it's one of the three big ones. Um, literally, when I got there, we, we arrived, in the, we, we, I arrived in the camera crew already there, we were in the car park, and there's a, a substation the size of this room right outside, big, huge, big top station, two lots of pylons going away from the substation. And I actually said, how do you know that they generated electricity in, in the oil refinery? Uh, you know, and, and I was very soon disabused of that by the head engineer that took us around the refinery. And he was very proud that the um, that refinery uses the same amount of electricity as Coventry and Leicester combined over a year. So an enormous amount of electricity is used to refine oil. An enormous amount of oil is used to burn a lot of oil to refine oil, uh, which are things that we don't know because it's normal, because it's hidden, because refineries aren't places that you go around with the kids on a rainy Saturday you know, in August. Um, and so it's, a, it's, a, it's just a thing, it's become normal, and that's, we're all, it's normal, we just put petrol in, and you've got a bit of money, you're paying that price, but then the water you buy in the, in the garage actually costs more per litre than the petrol. There's all these weird things that we said. And this is the kind of curse of the, of the electric car. It really drives you mad. I've got over it now. I've got over it. It's the first couple of years I've had it. So uh, I drive a Nissan Leaf. I've had it for uh, 2011, for five years. 55,000 miles. It's never broken down. I made it run out once just to see what happens. It was shocking. I, I was, the clock so was absolutely right. When it runs out, it stops. <laughs> it absolutely stops. It doesn't keep going. It stops, and there's nothing. You think, ah, oh, it's horrendous. Um, but it, it, to make it run out, this is what's so funny because that's the, always the first question. I'm sure any of you driver here will know. You're just in a car park, you get out of the car, and someone notices it's electric. Go, why happens when it runs out? It stops. What? <laughs> why happens when your diesel runs out? It stops, and then you've got to bleed it, and it costs a fortune, and it's a nightmare, and you've got to get a can of diesel from somewhere. Where do you get that from? You've got to walk miles with a can of diesel, and pour it in, and it won't start. It goes, <laughs> and it's really bad for it, and all those boring things. Is it a really good answer when someone says, how far does it go on a charge, which is the most common question we've all heard, is I always say now, and I'm really polite and nice about it, I say, I promise I will tell you exactly that, but tell me how much it costs you to drive 100 miles in your car. And they'll never know. 99% of people haven't got a clue. And then you ask, what car is it? And then you can tell them. But it's usually between 8 and 20 pence a mile, depending on the car. Range Rover, 20 pence. It's a Ford Kia. Well, no, what's that one? Ford Ka. That, cool. That's probably about 8 pence. And then I say, when they said, leaves about a penny a mile if I charge it overnight. And if I charge it from my solar panels, it's nothing. And then just watch their face. It's free. It's actually free. Actually, I get paid by the European community to drive it for nothing. <laughs> That's very specific. Depends on the person who you're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just put out talking of, of charging and uh, money, uh, which you'll hear about uh, in the much, much more professional speak we will have after me. Uh, Ecotricity um, charging for charging. Highway. We just put out the video this morning, which is an interview with Bell Fins from Ecotricity and an description of how to use the app. If you've got a signal, which you will have from the. Anyway, yeah. uh, all, all <laughs> those questions are answered and very uh, amusingly by Bell. And so that's not an issue I can deal with. But I've had quite a lot of accusations on Twitter that I'm being bribed by Ecotricity to keep quiet. So I asked Bell if he'd give me 11 million quid a year to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> And saying, said, say what you like, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yes, so the, the transition we're going through, I think, is, is fascinating and it's, it's growing, I think, faster than I expected. Uh, well, we 
So, so obviously electric car sales are going up worldwide, they're going up very rapidly, in this country they're going up, which is fantastic, and, and today is a great uh, example of that. And the car park that's down the hill, not just outside here, is chock full of Zoe's and BMW i3s and lots of Teslas, a hell of a lot of Teslas, and I, there's no way I could charge there, but I did park my car next in between uh, the very close to a Tesla by using the summon feature, and it did work. It's quite often when you want to show off that it won't connect and it won't do it. So I reversed my car into this space. There's no way an old man like me could get in that car. It won't even work. So when I go back, I'll have to summon it out. And if it doesn't work when I get out, it's going to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> but it does work most of the time. So I have a Tesla model that's now driven in 20s. I don't want to tell you because um, it's on a lease. Way over the limit. Um, <laughs> I mean, and they are remarkable vehicles, I'm sure, as uh, uh, Tesla owners here will testify. Um, horrifyingly expensive, if their mind is leased and the lease is breaking me. Um, it's a very rash decision. I'll explain what happened. Um, my wife was on a multiple Skype call to our two children, who are currently all at that stage, both in Australia. And um, they both, like, if you don't want to work at the Starbucks anymore, it's really stupid. We can dead send you some money. And then uh, my daughter goes, oh, I haven't paid my rent. Oh, hey, uh, hey, give me money. I hate you. I'm adopted. Which is the way our children speak. <laughs> They're very well brought up. And my wife, my wife said, and I was standing next to her, and she said, both of you get off your lazy asses and get a job. Your father's worked very hard for you all his life, and he deserves a Tesla. She said that. <laughs> <laughs> Transition extra vehicles like the quad bikes. So if you 
single bike racks that are outside here, but electric motorbikes, electric scooters, the conversion of the Volkswagen Beetle, which is beautifully done. I feel like we've just recorded an episode for that will go out in a couple of weeks. Brilliant, brilliant car. And so lovely to drive a, that car, which I used to have before the Beetle, but was freezing cold in the winter, the engine would break down, it was constantly falling to bits and going wrong. Because it was an old, you know, that same era, the Beetle, and all that ever happened. Reliable, safe, sensible, could go a long way, is faster <laughs> than the old vehicle. It's really, really nice that transition. But the other one that we've seen recently, the, we, we went to the first installation of a Tesla Powerwall in this country. It's in St. Albans. They've had it for about four months now. His average use of grid electricity over that four month period is 5%. So 5% of his electricity comes from the grid, 95% comes from his solar panels. When you see that in operation and actually operating, this is a, uh, a substantial family home for two kids, four people living in it, loads of tellers and things, you know, and washing machines, tumble dryers. And if you imagine if you, you could live in a world where your electricity bill was reduced by that, the installers and Tesla in particular are very keen to point out that it wouldn't be that over the whole year, but it would be about 75% of the consumption of the house would be from the system that's installed on it. Wrap that up. So at the moment it's one house, it makes no difference to the grid. A thousand houses, probably still not noticeable. Ten thousand houses, they might notice it just about the national grid control room outside the uh, half a million houses, you can switch off the power station. Two million houses, you can close down three power stations. It makes an enormous, catastrophically disruptive change to the way we produce and consume energy. Plug cars into your house that can, where the electricity can go both ways. I'd be very happy if the national grid took a kilowatt hour out of my Nissan Leaf in the morning because there was a peak or in the evening there was a peak and I'm not using the car. Because I think when I first heard about vehicle to grid, I was thinking, uh, you know, they'll just drain my battery and steal all my electricity. But it, the whole notion is you take a little bit out of a lot of cars and there's uh, systems being developed now where that, to make that possible. So if there were, Five million electric cars that were all plugged in, you can switch off another power station. The whole point is so when someone says to you, Oh, but we'll have to build loads of new power stations to power all these electric cars, it is so, so wrong. It's exactly the other way around. That, that, that we would, would need to import less coal, less gas from Mr. Putin, less oil from the wonderful and benign Saudi Arabian <laughs> uh, uh, You know, that, that, and it would employ thousands of people and it's, it would mean that we were generating most of the energy in our own country and there's lots of economic reasons behind it that are very interesting. So I'm really excited about seeing the beginnings of this emerging technology and it will do things that we can't predict, we can't understand. It will make changes that, that aren't all benign and aren't all good. It will, it will throw things out of kilter. It's like what's happening in Germany where they have so much renewable energy, the coal burning lobby and industry is loony. I can't understand it. I mean, they've made money out of burning coal for decades, century almost, and suddenly it's not worth it. They have to pay to burn coal to put electricity into the coal, into the grid at certain times of the day. It's, it's crazy. It doesn't work. And the two things don't mesh well. And there's all those arguments about base load, and I'm starting to see some really good papers coming out which basically say base load is bullshit, and that we don't need base load, and that we can do renewables for 100 percent of the, you know, for 100 percent of our needs, and that's I don't understand the ins and outs of it, and I know there's lots of arguments about it, uh, and I think that the the general public opinion is starting to go, hang on a minute, do we, you know, is heat treat pumps the, a good idea economically? Nothing to do with the environment or nuclear waste or anything to do with that, but it doesn't make sense economically. And there's a lot of clever, wealthy business people and industry people and big companies that are going, that's daft, we can make electricity ourselves for half the price, a quarter of the price that they do. You know? And that, so I do feel there is a, there is a, a change under, underfoot. Um, this talk was called Electric Cars Are Better. That's about the worst title. I think I, get, I, I think that was a very, very quick email when I was on the train. What's the talk called? Such electric cars are better. Better than what? Better than shitting yourself. <laughs> terrible. Uh, they are better, but uh, <laughs> they're different. Um, my brother is a, is a, makes, does make Jeremy Clarkson look like a wet liberal vicar on a piss bike with a basket in front. Um, uh, and he has, he kind of,
and grinds his teeth now. Because the, the Nissan Leaf fulfilled every prejudice that he ever had about electric vehicles. You know, Remember me, it looks weird. You're stupid. It's only for tree hugging neck and nibble on that. I don't know about you. It's my children, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and then he sort of tells me, he went, <laughs> and I took him for a ride and he went, ooh, I don't know about that. <laughs> so I think those things are interesting. I think there was a, there's a bit of one philosophy, if you can find it, it's the, the 15 reasons you can use to, to um, delay the uptake of electric vehicles. And it's very, very well written. It's in an American blog. I can't remember which one. Uh, and it is all about those things about big manufacturers. I mean, it's things I've been talking about here today. Big manufacturers who make million diesel engines a year, but they also sell an electric car. And then you go to the dealers and they say, no, electric cars don't work. What about our new diesel? It looks wonderful and it's got uh, Bluetooth navigation and, it, and you can join your iPhone to it, just like that. And they go, yeah, but I don't, it's got a diesel, I want the electric one. Oh, yeah, no one wants that. That is a huge change we've got to do and it's a real battle for those companies to, to adjust to maybe making electric vehicles. And I think the best thing really we had to uh, be happy about it was the diesel day. And what will happen with all big car manufacturers, because they've all been doing it, is that they lie and cheat, and they've been fooling us, and we're the suckers that have uh, gotten in with that. And we should be angry, and we should be upset, and we should make a fuss, and we should shout about it. And what's happened with Volkswagen is incredibly encouraging, because they are now really ramping up their electric car stuff, and they're going to make electric cars that do 200 miles, which they always could. The Nissan Leaf could have come out doing 200 miles. The Renault Zoe could have come out doing 200 miles. It is possible. It is technical. They will get there. I mean, I think by this time next year, we'll, we'll know about all the 200 plus mile models that are going to be on the market. Um, uh, you know, that will make a big difference. 200 miles, I now can say from experience in an electric car, means you don't think about range. So there's no such word as range anxiety with a Tesla Model S. I'll tell you what, you can get, and I'm sure this affects gentlemen of a certain age, I get bladder anxiety. So my bladder range is 145 miles, I've timed it, I've timed it when we were in France last year when we were driving back from Italy, I had a cup of coffee in the, down near, um, where were we, down the south, I can't remember, and we had the longest leg uh, between superchargers, 265 miles, and I knew we could do it, and we charged up at that supercharger, and we drove 140 miles, and I knew I had to stop, and there was a service, <laughs> a rest area, no superchargers, no electric car charging. We stopped for me, not for the car. The car was absolutely fine. Uh, that's the longest I've done in a, in a Tesla is 265. And I thrashed it a bit on the auto route, and there were some hills. And I could have gone 280, I think I could have done, if I'd driven a bit more carefully. Uh, and that's that great. I love that. Uh, for those of you who don't know Tesla, it tells you what percentage your battery will be when you get to the next charge point. And it said 5% when we set up. And when we got there, it was nine. Yeah! <laughs> I punched the air as I roared up to the supercharger. And then we had a really nice lunch in France, which is in Norway. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if I've gone on too long. Will someone shout at me? Am I? Am I? <laughs> That's good. Yeah, is that, have I, have I, because I don't want to go on too long. Because it's going to be, what's going to happen after this is some actual interesting people who actually know stuff. I'll quickly tell you because it's um, my daughter's 20th birthday. Uh, um, this, I agreed to do this a long time ago, and then in the interim period, my, uh, my daughter's been living in Australia, she's just come back, and in the interim period, a party was organised today. There's 120 people coming, I'm doing the barbecue. Uh, there's a tent up in the garden which got crushed by the rain last night, so before I came out tomorrow, I was banging in massive steel spikes and wrenching the tent up, which is great fun. Um, uh, and I've got to go back. This is the thing, you invite those people in your village to come to a party thinking they won't be here, they'll be on holiday. They're all there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a bit of a shock and a bit of a panic. So, thank you very much for listening to me because I have lots of answers. Anyway, now we've got uh, Simon.